<clears throat> this video is going to be a pretty important video that combines a couple of important things. I'm going to look at a, uh, an interacting species model, in particular a, um, a competing species model. But instead of going to the CD-ROM and just seeing what happens there, we want to learn how to deal with this with Mathematica, and in particular Euler's method. We'll use Euler's method for a two-dimensional situation like this system will be to try to approximate solution curves. So let's look up at the screen here and see if we can uh, quickly derive Euler's method for two-dimensional systems. And then we'll try to implement it on Mathematica. Remember the basic idea was that with Euler's method for one-dimensional systems is that you get um, a set of iterative formulas or recursive equations, recursion relations, relations. those are the different names we give it. We still get that with two-dimensional Euler's method, and there's two, really, two ways you can think about it. You can think about it either in terms of the scalar, a couple of scalar equations that you get, or you can think about it in terms of a vector equation. I'm going to initially think of it as a vector equation here right now, because that's the, the way that it's simplest to uh, relate to phase planes to, and to vector fields. So let's imagine we've got a, uh, a system of differential equations written in vector form. So y represents a vector, and dy dt will be my left-hand side. This will correspond to two derivatives for the components of y, little x and little y, the first derivative being dx dt, that's the derivative of the first component, and the second derivative being dy dt, little y, that'll be the derivative of the second component, but I'm thinking of differentiating both at the same time and just writing it as a vector derivative, dy dt, where y is a vector. And I'll think of the right-hand side as being a vector field, So the input there is a vector, or you want to think of inputs to vector fields as actually being points when you put the vector so that its base is at the origin. The output you really want to think of as being an arrow, though. <clears throat> so this gives us an output, f of y, that's going to be drawn as an arrow based at the point corresponding to y when you put the base of y at the origin. Technically speaking, I could actually make this non-autonomous I could put a T on the right-hand side, like is done in chapter 1. But to keep the notation and the ideas simpler, let's focus, like the book does in section 2.4, on autonomous equations. So we won't assume there's a T on the right-hand side. I'm at a certain point in the phase plane, labeled by little x and little y, where, again, y is the vector consisting of little x and little y for its components. I'm writing it as a column vector there. You could also write it as a point in the usual kind of point notation. I'm starting at a certain point. Let's call that y sub 0, where y 0 is a vector. That'll be my initial condition. In fact, I might say that if y of t represents the solution vector, then I want y of 0 to equal y sub 0. That's my initial condition. Euler's method does apply only to initial value problems. You need an initial value as well as the differential equation. So I'm at this point. Now remember, I think I said it's sometimes useful to imagine that the solution curve communicates with the differential equation. The differential equation governs the solution curve. It's like the point looks up at the differential equation and says, differential equation, where should I go and how fast? In what direction and at what speed? Because what the differential equation is saying is, go in such a way that your derivative of your position, which is really your velocity vector, equals the output of the vector field. Go at that instant in time with that rate of change, with that velocity. Let's pretend the velocity vector looks like that. In other words, this is the output of the vector field at the point y0. That'll be the velocity vector of the solution curve when it passes through that point at 
a given instant in time. In this case, it's t equals zero. Well, if a short amount of time goes by, it's not going to traverse that entire vector. The displacement of the point is going to be given by the velocity vector times the change in time, delta t. And if delta t is small, the point's not going to move very far along this vector. It might move only to there. So this lower left point refers to y0. This upper right point I'm going to call y1. Really what that is, is it's y0 plus a certain displacement, plus delta t, the amount of time that elapses, times the velocity vector at that point. Now, technically speaking, this line segment connecting these two points is not, in general, going to be the solution curve. The solution curve, in general, won't be straight because it's this distinction between instantaneous rate of change versus average rate of change. This velocity vector is the instantaneous rate of change of the solution curve at this point, but that instantaneous rate of change itself changes as the point moves. So, in reality, the point won't move exactly along a straight line, but by linearity, if delta t is small, it'll be close to that straight line. So in Euler's method, we go ahead and assume it stays on that straight line. But we need to update. Now we're at this point. That's our second point, which we label with y1 because our starting point is y0. We look at the vector field at that point. Maybe the vector field at that point looks like this. Maybe that's the velocity vector for any solution curve passing through this point at a certain instant in time. Do the same thing. Follow that vector forward in time by an amount delta t to get to the next point. Maybe it brings you up here. That would be our next point, y2. You take y1 and add on a certain displacement, the displacement being the time elapsed delta t times the velocity vector f of y1. And essentially, this is deriving Euler's method. The general formula for Euler's method, at least in terms of updating the point, is y sub k plus 1 is going to be the previous value of y, the previous point you were at, plus the displacement, which is approximated by delta t times the velocity vector at y sub k, which is given by plugging the point into the vector field. That gives you the velocity vector because that's really what the differential equation is saying, is the outputs of the vector field give you velocity vectors. Of course, we also need to update t. So there's also another equation here. t is the old value of t plus a certain amount delta t. Now, your book writes these in scalar form, and that's fine. Let me just quickly do that. If you think of f of y as being little f of x comma y for the first component and little g of x comma y for the second component, where x and y are little there also, then we can write an equivalent form for Euler's method in terms of two scalar uh, recurrence relations or difference equations. There's lots of names for these things. Like this for x and like this for y. kind of like two one-dimensional Euler's methods put together. All right? You want to be flexible and be able to think of it either way. Now, let's apply this to a competing species model. In this competing species model, we've got two species, x and y. In both cases, we're going to assume that the species uh, the population is modeled by a logistic model in the absence of the other species. For x, we'll assume it looks like this. And for y, we'll assume it looks like this. 
Those are logistic models. We ignore the minus sign for the moment. The equilibria for x, if y is absent, would be, would be 0 and 2. And for y, would be 0 and 3. But these species are competing, so we have interaction terms that both have negative coefficients, like that. Let's see if we can quickly find the equilibrium points for, the, for this. Um, factor things as much as you can. You can factor an x out of the top equation like this. I'm going to also multiply the 2 through the parentheses to get this. Don't forget about the minus y that comes from that term. And this one, I'm going to factor a y out. And there's what I would be left with. To find equilibrium points, I'd set these both equal to 0 and solve that system of equations. It's a nonlinear system. It's kind of tricky. One solution is obviously the origin. x, y equals 0, 0. We'll make both equations 0. Think of it this way now. If x equals 0, it makes this one 0. The second equation will be 0 if y is 0 or if y is chosen to make this part 0. Now, if x is 0, then that's 0 right there. And therefore, y must be 3 to make this factor 0. So we get another equilibrium point at 0, 3. On the other hand, if y is 0 to make this equation 0, then the top equation can be 0 if x is either 0 or if x is 2. So we get another equilibrium point at 2 comma 0. But there's a fourth equilibrium point that occurs when x and y, neither one is 0. And so you need to set both of those equations equal to 0. That really ends up being a system of linear equations. Really, x plus y equals 2, and 2x plus y equals 3. We could subtract the top equation from the bottom equation to get x must be 1, and then substitute to also get y must be 1. That gives us another equi equilibrium point at the point 1, 1. We've got four equilibria here in the phase plane. The origin, 2, 0, 0, 3, and 1, 1. Now, you might remember from the interacting species model part one that we used the CD-ROM and we looked in the first quadrant, and you might remember what happened. We got solutions that went down this way and over there, or if you were over here, they went down this way and then over there. Solutions starting down here went up toward this point and then over or up there. That's what happened with the model. Let's see if we can see the same things by implementing Euler's method for this system on Mathematica. I'm going to think of it in vector form, so I'm going to go back up here. Let's catch it back up here again real quick. I'm going to imagine this system of two scalar equations as one vector equation. Just by making these components, this will then be dy vector dt. And this thing right there is going to be my vector field. Capital F vector of y vector. Now let's go over to Mathematica and see if we can implement this. Now, I tried this using the, um, the more intuitive method back when you first read about Euler's method in section 1.4, where you use, uh, you actually type in the recursive formulas themselves into Mathematica. Um, but you might remember that, that if, you, if you let the number of iterations get too high, it took too long. And so it turned out to be better to use the nest list well, that's the same thing that's going to happen here, except the taking longer happens sooner for a smaller number of iterations. And so I think it's best if we go ahead and try to use nest list right from the beginning. Well, let's see. Why don't we pause the tape here? Maybe we should do that. Okay, I'm back. Um, I, I needed to go away for a minute because doing this was a little tricky, and I needed to remind myself how to do it. We needed to use nest list. Let's re quickly review how to use nest list. Okay, nest list is a nice way of getting Mathematica to uh, do iteration of a function to find the orbit of a of a discrete dynamical system. When you plug in a c and you, a seed and you plug that into the function to get another number, 
You plug that back into the function to get another, another number, you get a sequence of numbers. And nestless was a nice way to do that that didn't take too long. <clears throat> it's more efficient than trying to uh, plug in the recursive formulas on your own. Let's just do an example, a simple example with nestless, first of all. <clears throat> um, iterating x squared. Okay, so that's a one-dimensional function. The code looks like this, nest list. Then you plug in the function, which in this case I'm calling f. Then you plug in your seed, that's your starting value of x. I'll plug in, well, let's plug in 2 to start with. Then you type in the number of iterations. Let's go uh, 5 iterations. It gives you a list back out as output. I want to zoom in on that to see it well. The first number there is 2, that's the C, that's the x0. The second number there is x1. Plug in x0, 2, into the function, get 2 squared or 4. The third number is x1 squared, which is 4 squared, 16. Then 16 squared is 256. Then 256 squared is 65,536, etc. This particular list, you can see, is going off to infinity. It gets very, very large, very rapidly. That's just 10 iterations there. If I choose a different seed, like 0.99, <clears throat> the behavior happens to be different. Now the, the uh, points go off towards 0, go down towards 0. 0 0.9801 is 0.99 squared. The next number, 0 0.960596, is 0 0.9801 squared, etc. These are going towards zero. That's a very quick review of how to use nestlist. And it's what's going to make our implementation of Euler's method more effective. So what do we need for Euler's method if we're going to apply this? Well, let's go back up here and type in the right-hand side of the differential equation for both the first equation in the competing species model and the second equation. So I'm using little f to represent the first component. And if you recall, that was 2x times 1 minus x over 2 minus x times y. That's the right-hand side of the first equation, the first component of the vector field. The right-hand side of the second equation, or the second component of the vector field, we call g in general. And it was 3x or 3y times 1 minus y over 3 minus, uh, I think it was 2 times x times y. Double check that here. Yeah. So that was the right-hand side of the second equation. So I've got those entered. I'll go ahead and pick a delta t, a time step. Let's start with point 0.1, say. I guess I'll enter the rest of it on this line. What we need to do now is we need to use nestlist in some way that implements Euler's method. And, well, Essentially, I'm just going to type in that vector equation for Euler's method and use nestlist on that. Let me just quickly review that, catch it over here. What I'm talking about is this vector equation right there, though I'm going to be specific about what the components are. Essentially, this thing over here is my Euler's method function that I want to iterate for a fixed delta t. The vector y is the input, though I'll write it in terms of its components. So keep that in your mind. Maybe write it down right now and pause the video, perhaps, until you have it written down. And then we'll come back and we'll do it on Mathematica here. So let's do that now. In section 1.4, just for fun, I call this function em function. You could use any name you want. There was nothing special about that. EM standing for Euler's method. It's, a, it's really the, the vector field is what I'm going to type in. 
Think of the input as being a list, or a point if you prefer. And um, it would be good to specify that those are variables by putting underscores. Colon equals, I need to define what this function is, and it really is just what I get from Euler's method. And in fact, I need to do one more thing here. It's the vector field, but I also want the t in there, too. I want to update the value of t. So I need to put a t in there also. So the input, in a sense, is three-dimensional now. The output is going to be three-dimensional, too. I update the value of t by adding delta t, like this. I update the value of x by taking the old value of x and adding delta t times the output of the first component, f of little f of x, y. And then I must update y also, so I put y plus delta t times the second component of the vector field, little g of x, y. So that will be the output of this em function for any given input. This is the function I want to iterate. That will implement Euler's method. I want to iterate this function using nestless now. And I will, talk, I will call the um, output of, of this em approximation is the output of nestlist. It will be a list. From iterating this Euler's method function, starting at a certain seed, and then for a certain number of iterations. Now, the seed is going to be a list. How many iterations should I go? Well, let's go um, 50. You can do a lot with nest list. It's very efficient. What kind of seed do I need? I need a seed for the EM, for the EM function. I need a T value, I need an X value, and I need a Y value. T is typically starting at 0, so I'll put a 0 for T. Now, it's not that you can't choose other values for T, but typically we start at 0. What about X and Y? Well, I want to start in the first quadrant, if this is going to be relevant, and trying to think about what that phase plane looks like. Let's start at a low value of X and Y, and hopefully we'll see the graph traverse up toward that equilibrium point at the point 1, 1, and then perhaps go one way or the other toward one of the other equilibrium. So I'll try point 0.1, comma, point 0.1. Now I could put a colon after this if I want. Enter it. If I didn't put the colon, you should know by now that you will see the output. You'll see the list EM approximation. There it is. Let's take a look at the nature of this list. It's a list that's going to have... I guess it'll have 51 elements in it, because we're starting at 0. We're iterating 50 times. We get up to the point that's got a subscript of 50. But since we start at 0, that means we've got 51 elements in this list. Each element is a three-tuple, an ordered um, triple of, point, of numbers. It's really a three-dimensional point, the first component of which is the t value going up by 0.1 each time. And the second component and third components are really the x and y, based on how I've set this up. If I try to plot this, I'd have to try to plot it in three dimensions. I'd like to get rid of the t. In fact, when you think about how phase planes are drawn, they're drawn without t in there. You just see how x and y change over time. So I'd like to get rid of the t values here before I make a plot in the phase plane. <coughs> Here's one way you can do that. Let me go ahead and get rid of the output there. Um, you can use a list operation. Maybe I'll, I'm going to create a new list that's just going to have the x and y coordinates. So I'm calling an em approximation no time. So I'm emphasizing that I'm getting rid of the t. What do I need to do to create this list? I need to go through the old list, the EM approximation, and delete all the T's. How can you do that? Well, uh, here's a way you can do it. Table is a command that is quite often used to create lists. Um, and the command take, Q 
can be used to take lists that you've already created and take parts of them and to create new lists. I want to take the list EM approximation and I want to delete the, the first um, element of each three-dimensional element in EM approximation. But I need to do it sort of element by element. I need to look at each one of those three tuples, order triples, one at a time, and delete the first component one at a time. By putting an I inside double brackets like this, that's going to look at individual elements in EM approximation. Just a quick review of that, if I type in, for example, EM approximation with three inside double brackets, that's going to look at the third list. And I must have typed it wrong. Yeah. Okay. Right, so there we go. There's the third element in the list. T is 0.2, X is 0.14, and Y is 0.16. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to let I vary. It's going to be my iterator here. But take, I want to take the last two elements. There are other ways to do this. You can also delete the first element in a certain way. But take the last two elements of each list by putting a minus 2 right there after the comma inside the take command. That will take the last two elements, the x and the y, and ignore the first one, the t's, for each one of these three-dimensional points. But I want to let i vary from 1 to 51. Though in general, when I want to allow for perhaps um, more iterations, I might want to just put the length of EM approximation as the last value of I. It'll be 51 in this case. This should do it. This should create a new list where all the T's are deleted. There we go. The T's have been deleted. These are all just the X and Y. We can see the, uh, the X2 comma Y2 right here, what I just highlighted. It's the third element of this new list. But in terms of the subscript, it's X2 comma Y2 at 0 0.14, 0 0.16, like I showed you before. These are all lists of ordered pairs now, points in the plane. Now I can plot that list with list plot. I can just do it very simply like that. There they are. You might like to add some things to this picture, like you might want to impose um, a certain scale, um, or let x and y go over a certain range. Let's keep it like that for the moment. Well, let's just look at what we have here. We can also do the joined if we want. Joined error true to join those. But you would need to keep in mind if you, as you look at this, that the point is starting in the lower left, goes up and toward the right, and then moves up and toward the left as you go. In fact, we could even get fancier with all of this, and maybe I will in the Mathematica notebook. I haven't made that yet. Um, we could get fancier with this and use manipulate to animate it and watch the point move. I won't take the time to do that in this video, but I'll do it in the notebook. But you need to keep in your head that it is moving from the lower right to the upper, upper right and then the upper left moves like this. We can see the speed if we get rid of the joint. When the points are further apart, it's moving faster. Like down here, and it's moving relatively fast. It's slowing down when it nears that equilibrium point. I guess it doesn't get too close to it at 1-1. One, one. We should impose a plot range on this. I'll go 0 to 5 for both x and y. 
see how it looks at least. Way down there now. The point one one is right here. It didn't go too close to it. But now we can play with it a bit and adjust the initial condition and see if we can get it to go close to the point one one. The equilibrium in the middle. Um, probably we need to choose an initial value of x that's a bit bigger. So it sort of moves us to the right, like maybe 0.3 or something. Get, put a semicolon after this one. Now, uh, it didn't go toward the point 0.11, too close, but it went down that way. So we see, we see the other kind of behavior, that it's going off toward that other equilibrium. In that first case, y was surviving and x is dying out. In the second case, x is surviving and y is dying out. So let's try point 0.2. See how close we get to the equilibrium point 0.11. We get pretty close. Look at that. Is it going to approach that point as t goes to infinity? Well, it's pretty hard to find an exact initial condition that will allow it to approach that point as t goes to infinity. If I let this go for a larger number of iterations, for example, to 100, we see that, in fact, this point is now going away from the point 1, 1, and will eventually go down toward that other equilibrium point on the x-axis. There it goes at the point 2, 0 as t goes to infinity. It's very hard unless you're extremely lucky or it's a simpler system, to pick an initial condition that's going to go toward that point at 1, 1 as t goes to infinity. There is, theoretically speaking, and, and, well, and more than theory, in reality, there is a solution curve that does go toward that point at 1, 1 as t goes to infinity. I mentioned it on the last video. It's called the separatrix because it separates different kinds of behavior. There's one down here, and there's also one up here. The real official name for that curve is called the, um, the stable manifold of the point 1, 1. The point 1, 1 we'll see is called a saddle point. You've got a stable manifold with some solution curves that go straight toward it. You also have an unstable manifold of solution curves that go away from it as t goes to infinity, and in addition go towards it as t goes to minus infinity, that's called the unstable manifold of that saddle point. Um, and those manifolds, those curves, determine the behavior of all the other solution curves. It depends on where your initial condition is as far as what the end behavior is, is either as t goes to plus infinity or minus infinity. Let's just quickly check a couple other initial conditions. Let's try a, a larger one, like up at maybe 5.5. Five. Uh, what happened there? Let's see. It's uh, I'm not sure what happened. Let's try that again. Maybe let's try uh, three three. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened with the five five. Okay, here we are at three three. It's going very rapidly to that point that after 0.1 units of time before it starts slowing down as it approaches not real close to 1, 1, but uh, it is slowing down when it's in the neighborhood of 1, 1 before it heads down toward that point. If I pick my initial condition to be, say, 2, 3, I bet it goes to the other equilibrium. Yep, it's going off the other way. So this helps us to start to build up, and we can combine these plots as well, and it helps us to start to build up a picture of the phase plane, called a phase portrait, of this particular nonlinear system, the, uh, the system for competing species. You, as you've been reading about and learning about in chapter two, should also be able to go ahead and graph x and y versus time individually and see what happens. That's a very important skill to be able to go between the phase plane and the regular graphs of the components versus time. That's the end of this video.